George Soros launched a bombshell accusation against India over the weekend, and Indian officials hardly waited to retaliate. We're going to see what's going on between the 92-year-old financier of global chaos and the rising civilizational state of India, and how it signals the awakening of a new world, one where Soros' influence will be no more. George Soros spoke at the Munich Security Conference over the weekend, contrasting his vision of the ideal world order with the rising nationalism in places like Russia, China, and India. India is an interesting case. It's a democracy, but its leader, Narendra Modi, is no democrat inciting violence against Muslims was an important factor in his meteoric rise. Modi maintains close relations with both open and closed societies. India is a member of the Quad, which also includes Australia, the US, and Japan but it buys a lot of Russian oil at a steep discount and makes a lot of money out of it. Now, India didn't take those comments sitting down. This is Subramaniam J. Shankar. He's the Minister of External Affairs in India, and he's a bit of a rising rock star in India's ruling conservative party known as the BJP or the Bharatiya Janata Party. He's a brilliant speaker and thinker, and he was asked to comment on Soros' accusations. And just yesterday at the Munich Security Conference, uh, George Soros spoke on, on many issues, mm -hmm. uh, but specifically uh, on open and closed societies and called on uh, institutional reform uh, in India. How do you as foreign minister uh, of India explain this when you're dealing with your uh, quad ministers in particular, as well as others? Well, uh, look, uh, I, I actually made two points. One, how the world is changing. It is rebalancing. It is less Euro-Atlantic. I don't think everybody gets that. I think old habits die hard. I mean, very candidly, uh, there, are, there are still people in the world uh, who believe that uh, uh, their definition, their preferences, their views, uh, must override everything else. So, since you mentioned this specific example, I, I don't know how familiar people are with uh, what was said at the Munich conference. Essentially, Mr. Soros said India is a democratic country, but he doesn't think the Prime Minister of India is a democrat. Uh, and, uh, by the way, a few years ago, uh, in the same conference, I was there at that time, he actually accused us of uh, planning to strip millions of Muslims of their citizenship, which of course didn't happen. It was a ridiculous suggestion. But you have to understand what this actually means. Uh, I could take a view that the individual in question, Mr. Soros, is a uh, old, rich, opinionated person sitting in New York who still thinks that his views should determine how the entire world works. Now, if I could only stop at old, rich, and opinionated, I would put it away. But he's old, rich, opinionated, and dangerous. You know, because what happens is when such people and such views and such organizations, they actually invest resources in shaping narratives, you know. That's right. Soros is old, rich, opinionated and dangerous, that coming from India's Minister of External Affairs. And what he just said about Soros is perfect. Soros, when all is said and done, can claim he's a Democrat until he's blue in the face. It doesn't change the fact that he's doing everything he possibly can to orchestrate world events irrespective of voter will and intention. To me, that's what makes Soros so diabolical when all said and done. He virtue signals. He, he reputation launders under the guise of democratic open societies when in point of fact, behind the scenes, he's doing absolutely everything he can to undermine the will of voters. And Minister Jashankar called him out on it. As many of you know, Soros' thought and activist career 
or organize around the idea of what he calls the open society. It's, he actually gets the term from Karl Popper in his classic work, The Open Society and Its Enemies. And according to Popper, open societies are rational societies, whereas closed societies are inherently irrational. So open societies guarantee and protect rational exchange centered on the individual, whereas closed societies force people to submit to authorities, you know, particularly traditionalist authorities, religious, political, economic, what have you. Now, laying aside the obvious critique that Soros is blatantly committing an either-or fallacy, or the fallacy of what we call the excluded middle. In other words, there are clearly more conceivable options than either an open or closed society. Laying that aside, most agree that Soros is defining intellectual principles cosmopolitan internationalism, the notion that the world should constitute a single global community that transcends nationalisms, tribalisms, and sovereign states. Many do not recognize that probably the most galvanizing factor for all this is the role that apocalyptic environmentalism plays in Soros's philosophy. Soros sees the planet as basically expiring, and only the galvanizing of the world's populations into a fully cooperative global community can we hope to overcome this ecological challenge. So interestingly, apocalyptic environmentalism appears to be the motivating factor that's galvanizing his web of billion-dollar NGOs that interfere into the politics of sovereign nations across the planet. And again, this is what's so key to the nefarious nature of Soros. If for him, what's at stake is the very survival of the planet, then populations cannot possibly be allowed to choose the wrong leaders. So that's why all this rhetoric about open societies and democracy and human rights is utter bunk. The only legitimate governments are governments that go along with Soros's environmental activism. Unfortunately for Soros, as Jay Shankar made clear, the world is changing. It's moving away from the ability of one guy sitting in a penthouse in New York to dictate to the rest of the world how it's supposed to operate. That is what's going to make your day when you see what Jay Shankar has to say. But first, make sure to click on the link below and protect yourself from our current economic insanity from bumbling Biden with the timeless value of gold and silver. As you know, patriots of the centuries have always relied on gold and silver to protect their assets during economic storms. And that is where the amazing patriots over at Gold Co. come in. If you have $50,000 or more in an IRA, 401k, or savings account, you need to protect those assets from bumbling Biden's insanity with the timeless value of gold and silver. Click on the link below and talk to our good friends over at Gold Co. They want you to succeed so much, they're offering up to $10,000 in free silver if you open up an account with them. But that is a limited time offer, so don't wait. Click on that link below or visit my special website, Turley Talks likes gold.com. Dr. Jashankar is a member of what's known as the BJP or the Bharatiya Janata Party, headed by Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who obviously Soros does not like. As part of this cultural revival, Prime Minister Modi has actually publicly called for a new post-globalist world order a number of times. And at the heart of that new world order is the rise of what scholars are calling civilization states, where the old civilizational orders of the ancient world are actually once again rising up and bringing an end to the globalist modernist world of Soros. In the Hindu vision, the modern world represented what's called Kali Yuga, or the Age of Darkness. But the renewal of Indian civilization under the auspices of the BJP party has many believing that the world is entering a new epoch or a new era that they call Satya Yuga. And the Satya Yuga is a golden age where people return to their religious and cultural traditions. It's an age of purification and righteousness. It's an age of increasing wisdom and virtue. And that is precisely what India as a rising civilization state means for more and more people. The days of someone like George Soros sitting back and dictating how the world is going to work are over. A very different world is rising that doesn't take its marching orders from people like Soros. And Dr. J. Shankar is making that quite clear. This is one of his most brilliant answers when asked recently how India is going to side with Russia and Ukraine or in the wider conflict with the United States and China. Um, the, the crux of the question, which I asked a few people in um, 
uh, in the political circles, in the financial circles, what's your big question? And one of the foremost geopolitical strategists on Wall Street sent me this question for you. Mm -hmm. And the question is simple. If and when the choice comes down to it, not today, not tomorrow, but in the future, and she strongly believes it will, for India, will it become, in terms of support, the US or China? And that will be kind of a defining moment that comes out of the situation that we face with Russia right now. Look, uh, uh, number one, uh, the, you know why I wanted to uh, interrupt you in a way. I mean, I'm, I'm partly reacting to the previous observation. You know, somewhere Europe has to grow out of the mindset that Europe's problems are the world's problems. But the world's problems are not Europe's problems. That it's, if it is you, it's yours. If it is me, it's ours. I think that's something, uh, and I see, you know, reflections of that. Uh, again, in terms of, you know, there is a linkage today which is being made. You know, a linkage between China and India and what's happening in Ukraine. So come on, guys. I mean, China and India happened way before anything happened in Ukraine. So the Chinese don't need a precedent somewhere else in the world on how to, you know, engage us or not engage us or be difficult with us or not be difficult with us. So I, I, as I said, I mean, I just see this as frankly a not very clever argument, a very self-serving one. Uh, and uh, uh, this idea that, you know, your grand strategy must be about how you will choose. I will do what as all of us do. I will weigh the, the situation, you know, like uh, everybody, after all, what do, uh, how do countries eventually make decisions? They but find, Shankar, there, there will uh, always be two axes at this point. I think it's an, it's an understood, accepted fact that you have the West, US-led, you have China as the next uh, potential axis. Where does India fit into this? But are you no, planning to not the, No, aside? I'm sorry. That is exactly where I disagree with you. This is, this is the construct you are trying to impose on me. And I don't accept it. I mean, I, I don't feel, I don't think it's necessary for me to join this axis or not. And if I'm not joining this, I must be with the other one. I don't accept that. I mean, I think I, I am a, I'm one fifth of the world's population. I am what today the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. Uh, I, I mean, forget the history civilization bit. Everybody knows that. But I, I think I'm entitled to have my own side. I'm entitled to weigh my own interests, make my own choices. And my choices will, uh, will not be cynical and transactional, but they will be a balance of my values and my interests. There is no country in the world which disregards its interests. What Dr. Jay Shanker just schooled that reporter in is in the fact that the Cold War world, a bipolar world, where I have two major political poles, the United States and the Soviet Union, that world is dead. That world where Europe's problems are the world's problems, either you're on the side of the West or you're not, that world is dead. That bipolar world is not the world that India lives anymore. India lives in what's called a multipolar world, where multiple power centers are rising, precisely because the old ancient civilizations that were in many ways buried under layers of modernist industrial concrete are once again rising up and remaking the world order. India is one-fifth of the world's population. India is the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. India is, its, in many respects, India is its own world. And it will govern according to the unique interests and values of India. And there's nothing that old Cold War leftovers like George Soros can do to stop it. As always, make sure to smack that bell and subscribe button. You will definitely want to check out my latest video on Don Lemon out at CNN. You're not going to want to miss it. So make sure to click on the link and I'll see you over there. God bless.